He who obeys me will not be put to shame. They who serve me shall have life everlasting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. <clears throat> Today is the feast of the maternity of Our Lady. It is the feast of the reality, the fact of her motherhood such that she is in fact truly a mother and is not merely a metaphor it is not a symbol it is not poetic license and this feast was instituted to commemorate the definition the dogma from the council of ephesus in 431 where it was defined that mary our lady is the theotokos which is greek for the mother of god And we know, most likely, from experience, that that's a very objectionable idea to Protestants. They will retort, God is eternal, so how can he have a mother? And this feast, this mystery of Our Lady's maternity, touches on and is intimately connected to the mystery of the Incarnation. And when we speak about the Incarnation, we're speaking about the hypostatic union, that is, the union of two natures, the divine nature and the human nature in the one divine person of our Lord. And so we must say that there, our Lord is not a human person but he does have a true human nature. And to this objection that we meet sometimes with from a Protestant, the syllogism is actually pretty simple. Our Lady is the mother of Jesus. Jesus is God. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. And usually the conversation veers off into some other tangent that is not exactly on point. But this feast reminds us that in all reality, Our Lady is truly the biological mother of Jesus Christ, who is God. But she's also our mother also, truly our mother also. And so we can ask, well, when did she become our mother? Commonly, we might read or we maybe even hear that it was at the cross when our Lord said to St. John, Behold thy mother. But in reality, that statement from our Lord, he's actually talking about something that has already happened. He's acknowledging a reality that's already present, not causing it at that time. In truth, it's since the Incarnation, since Our Lady conceived in her womb our Lord, that is when she began to be our Mother as well. Simply because she's Mother of the Head of the mystical body, and so she must be the mother of the members of that mystical body. And that's us. And she didn't stop being a mother at the cross. She continues to exercise her motherhood towards us at every instant. Not only in the moments of crisis or in the moments of despondency, but at every instant. Mothers don't stop being mothers to their children when they run away or behave badly. So likewise, Our Lady doesn't stop being our mother when we sin. But rather, she increases her effort to get us back to what is for our true happiness. In the biological order, in the way of genetics, it's normal that traits of the parents, both the father and mother, are transmitted to their children. 
you might hear that in meeting someone who knew your parents and they meet you, the offspring, and they say, you look like your daddy or you look like your mom. You sound like them. You have their eyes. You have this or that trait. And that's normal. Unfortunately, the gifts and virtues of Our Lady cannot be transmitted to us genetically, but they can be transmitted to us by grace. But how does she exercise her maternity towards us? How does that come about? Well, number one, she transmits divine life. Note that word, she transmits. She doesn't cause, but she transmits divine life, which is the life of her son. Such that our Lord is, in all truth, the life of the soul. And she has given him to us. In addition to that, she is the woman associated to the sacrifice of our Lord, par excellence. She is transmitting this divine life through her involvement in the sacrifice of her son. She is the creature that cooperated in, an, in this unique, this, this singular manner with the work of the redemption. So much that by divine design, by divine will, she distributes the grace of our Lord to us. And from this point of view, she nourishes, she guides, she protects us. And she helps us to grow in this life of grace in order to reach what St. Paul calls this perfection, this full statue, stature of Christ. And she is so desirous of transmitting that divine life that had the soldiers backed out at the last moment, had the soldiers refused to go through with the execution of our Lord, of his crucifixion, her disposition was such that she would have nailed him herself for the sake of this divine life and this conformity with the will of the Father. A second way that she exercises her maternity is that she intercedes in our favor. Her supplications are directed to her son in order to obtain grace for us. Son, they have no wine. Son, they have no grace. Son, they have no mass. Son, they have no life. And that's why the fathers of the church will speak of her as this all-powerful intercessor. And this is all due to her perfect union, union of heart, this perfect communion that she has with her son. She desires what he desires. This one heart that they share. And also because of her faith, her faith that would, in fact, move mountains. She also exercises this maternity through her universal mediation of graces. Now, this has never been defined as a dogma of the faith, but theologians will say that it is definable. It has all the characteristics required to be defined as a dogma of the faith. But even though it's not defined, it is still something to believe. She distributes the graces of her son that were obtained for us with his redemption and which she has obtained through her intercession. She is, in that sense, the distributrix of all graces. Not only the mediatrix, but the distributrix. She actually gives them to our souls. And the entire treasury of heaven is at her disposal. 
There is no such thing as an out-of-stock grace. Currently unavailable will never be said of a grace needed. And a fourth way that she exercises this maternity is that she visits and intervenes in our lives and in the life of the church. We have our own story here of this intervention, this visit, as it were, in relation to the community and those attached to it. Just as the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of fire at night went before the Jews in the desert after they had departed Egypt, and these pillars showed them the way, the Our Lady, this new pillar, the pillar that we see represented in the famous dream of St. John Bosco, this new pillar, Our Lady, she goes in front of us during the times of confusion, the time of heartache, and times of battle, leading us safely to the heart of her son and in his church. She also has all these apparitions in the history of the church where she comes and displays her maternal concern, her maternal solicitude for sinners, for the situation in the world, the situations in the church. At Lourdes, penance, 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 she said to St. Bernadette. La Salette, where she wept, for the sake of the sins of humanity that were so offensive to Almighty God. How touching of a representation to us. To see your own mother cry. At Pomain in France. Where she held the red cross in her hands. The red crucifix to be precise. At Fatima, pray the rosary every day. Pray and do penance for sinners who fall like snowflakes into hell because no one does penance for them. If men do not stop offending Almighty God, He will send them a chastisement such that the world has never seen. What greater chastisement can we expect than that the entire world thinks that this religion occupying the, all of the Catholic institutions is in fact Catholic. That this is the institution of Christ, this is the religion of Christ. What greater chastisement can God send? We dare, we, we tremble within to ask that question. And so we have in this feast an incentive, an incentive to go to our mother because she wants to help us and she wants us to help us she wants to help us to save our souls to get us into heaven that's her desire and like any mother if she could do it for us she would in order to secure the well-being of her children but God has decreed that we do have a cooperation imposed upon us. And so that all that she can do is, in a sense, all that she can do is help. She can give us the means. She can give us the directions. She can give us all of the assistance that we required, but the task is ours. But we have the perfect means in her. We have the perfect means in her in how to get to heaven. She gives her own tools to us. She puts us on her team, we can say. 
the winning team. Even if we think we're on the B team, or if there is such a thing, the C team, on down, we're on the winning team because it's hers and she will have the victory. We have her rosary in all of the different variations that there are of it. We have her scapular, not only the brown, but the green scapular. The blue scapular of her Immaculate Conception, the black scapular of her sorrows, her miraculous medal given to St. Catherine Nabore. So really, our task in this program, in this cooperation, is to put ourselves in her maternal, immaculate hands. Because to obey her, in obeying her, we are obeying her son. And therefore, if we obey her, we won't be put to shame. And if we honor her and we serve her as a mother, we will never fail. And in the end, her Immaculate Heart will triumph, first and foremost, in our souls. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.